Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to see so many familiar faces and some new faces um, here at our um, convening of the Contra Costa County Equitable Economic Recovery Task Force. Uh, my name is Kristen Connolly. I'm the executive director of the Contra Costa Economic Partnership, which has been doing this work um, in conjunction with the um, with really important county partners. Um, we've been leading this economic, uh, equitable economic recovery task force, along with the Contra Costa Employment and Human Services Department and the Contra Costa County Workforce Development Board. So I just wanted to welcome you all and uh, let you know that, so as a task force, we've been meeting um, since last August and really trying to uh, be action oriented and talk about how we need to build back a, an economy that drives economic mobility and really increases opportunity for all residents of Contra Costa. We've been focused, laser focused on our residents who make less than $40,000 a year um, because that's who's been most impacted and certainly communities of color all across the region. So um, today we're gonna be uh, diving in to um, connections between um, uh, the, the importance of um, improving and increasing uh, services and access to early childhood education and the link between child, you know, really breaking cycles and, and, and breaking childhood poverty as an economic driver. And we're excited to be joined by so many really uh, expert folks in this, um, in this field and in this area who've been our partners on the task force and in, in lots of different work. So um, uh, what we're gonna do is just, uh, just to give you a quick overview of the agenda, we're going to go ahead and hear um, a couple of different presentations, um, and I'll, I'll introduce uh, those folks in a minute, but we're first going to hear a presentation from Camilla Rand, who's the Deputy Director of First Five Contra Costa. Then we're going to hear a presentation from Devorah Levine, um, who's the Executive Director of the Dean and Margaret Lesher Foundation. And then what we're going to do is bring in a couple other experts um, to uh, join our two presenters and talk and, and have a bit of a panel discussion starting at about 9.50. Then we're gonna take a, a quick break at 1020 before we welcome our keynote speaker for today's convening, um, Michael Tubb. So, and then once the, once our, uh, we're gonna have about an hour with Michael Tubbs and then we're gonna go ahead and break out into some breakout rooms to debrief on what we've heard and talk about how that informs our work as a task force. So um, if I, I'm gonna just take a quick look and make sure that we're all set. Um, it looks good. Again, uh, Lindy mentioned it at the top, but just for sake of making sure that we, um, we have a good, good acoustic quality on this, everyone is muted. Um, and so if you have any questions or any comments or just wanna share some love or you're excited about something or wanna make some noise, please, please put that in the chat. Um, this is a, a great group of folks and I'm excited to be here. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce um, our first presenter today, um, who I had the good fortune of meeting um, back when I was uh, Chief of Staff to Contra Costa Supervisor Karen Lachoff. So uh, Camilla Rand is, as I mentioned before, is the Deputy Director of First Five Contra Costa. Prior to joining First Five, Camilla was the Division Manager of the Contra Costa County Community Services Department. As director of the largest child care program in the county, she oversaw the Head Start, Early Head Start, state-funded um, child development, and CalWORKs voucher programs. So um, Camilla is an expert in so many things that we want to know about, and um, I'm excited for her to share uh, her presentation. So Camilla, we can't applaud. We can't give you big applause, but please know that we are thrilled that you're here and um, appreciate what you're about to share with us. So thanks for getting us started. Camilla Rand. Thank you so much, Kristen. It's such an honor to be here. And um, I'm excited to talk about something that I am so feel so passionate about, early childhood. I'm also excited to be here with my colleague, Devorah Levine from Lesher. We worked together for years. So just as Kristen said, before I get started, I have a background in early care and education. And before I was a director way back when, I started off as a preschool teacher. So absolutely, this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, and now at First Five, we're so passionate about young children, and we hope that by today, after this presentation, you come away with some of that passion as well. 
So next slide, please. All right. So 22 years ago, through Proposition, Proposition 10 funds, you all re may remember the Tobacco Tax Dollar Initiative, first fives across the state were established to prioritize the health and well-being of young children and their families. Our mission and vision is to foster the optimal development of our children prenatal through five years of age so every child is healthy, ready to learn, and supported in safe, nurturing families and communities. So this commitment was and continues to be a recognition that when children are set up to realize their full potential, not only do they benefit, but our communities benefit and become even stronger. So ever since our funding, we've been shouting this message from the rooftops to get more people on board with the idea that strong supports in the first five years set a person up for a lifetime of opportunity. So why is that? Why is early childhood so critically important? Next slide, please. So the brain is built through a process that begins before birth and continues to, into adulthood. For these first five years, children are developing the foundations by which they'll learn, behave, and grow. So just like constructing a house, for those of you who have built a house from the ground up, building a brain requires solid materials, a good work crew to lay the foundation, frame the rooms, wire the electrical system, do a nice coat of paint. So we think about these early years as a time when strong relationships, safe and nurturing communities, and educational opportunities are critical to do just that. Next slide, please. And we see that the sooner we invest in making sure that our early brain building crews are strong and well resourced, the higher our returns. So this is really well demonstrated in a 1962 study by James Heckman. Many of you may have known the great, known about the great Nobel laureate in economics. The Perry study um, showed that high quality birth to five programs for low income African American children can deliver, deliver a 13 year, 13% 13 per year return on investment due to better outcomes in education, health, social behaviors, and employment. And since then, countless studies have shown that this return on investment for, works for really every child. And so what we call the Heckman curve here, what you see on the screen, makes sense. Supports and interventions that start early make the most of incredible human potential that each of us has. So we talk a lot about preschool. However, you can see from this curve, um, the emphasis of the importance of prenatal, infant and toddler investment is also critically important. Simply put, the earlier we start, the better. Next slide. So we know how important these early years are. What do we do? What kind of supports can we provide? How can we make the most out of early childhood? Next slide. So the supports we can provide are like charging stations that power up a child's development and learning. Think about the electrical in the house. We want to make sure that people and organizations in our communities are part of a high wattage, densely networked charging system that all children and their families can plug into. So this system includes early quality, early learning opportunities through child care and preschool family child care homes, support for mental, physical, and behavioral health, safe environments and neighborhoods for children to learn and play and develop, and strong caregiver and community relationships. It really, really truly does take a village. So our work at First Five has been all about making sure this power grid is connected and optimized for as many children as possible. So we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into one aspect of this power grid. Quality early learning is one critical part of what's needed for a robust early childhood system. And it's really helpful to see just how far reaching these effects are. All right, next slide. So children who participate in high quality early learning care and education have fewer behavioral problems, 
greater edu educational attainment and higher wages later in life. Parents can go to work. Um, they have increased job opportunities, especially for women who are most often the primary caregivers. And there are dividends for society too. For every dollar we invest in early learning, there's anywhere from a seven to $16 return on investment. Remember the Heckman curve I just showed you? Um, these returns come from increased tax revenue, decreased costs associated with incarceration, remedial education. So the investments for early childhood pay out right now, and they also pay out later. When children enter kindergarten ready to learn 12 years down the line, they're most likely to graduate academically strong and have positive physical and mental health outcomes. So an investment in early learning is really an investment for our workforce. <clears throat> Next slide. So when we talk about early quality early learning, we really need to talk about school readiness. Uh, First Five conducted a study in 2018, a kindergarten readiness assess assessment actually, and we saw that early learning power grid on full display, the one I showed you a few slides back. The children who were most ready for kindergarten were those that were well fed, well rested, had access to literacy resources, access to early learning such as preschool or transitional kindergarten and had parents who were confident and felt competent in their parenting. Here again, early childhood and learning plays such a critical role. So that same kindergarten readiness assessment also found that over half of Contra Costa children are not fully ready for kindergarten. <clears throat> Those children, unfortunately, are disproportionately children of color and live in East Contra Costa County, as you can see from this graph here. Some of you may remember the Opportunity Graph infographic we released in collaboration with the Contra Costa Economic Partnership, Lesher, and Children Now that really describes many of these disparities. So thinking back to the power grid metaphor, these disparities are really rooted in sort of a patchy charging station system for very young children. It's built in a way that provides fewer opportunities for some of our community's children. For example, some neighborhoods have grocery stores, parks, childcare homes and centers, and access to employment and fair wages. Other communities, particularly those of color, have fewer of these important resources due to lack of public and private funding. And our work as a county is really to rewire that charging system across our community so that children and families, no matter where they live, no matter who they are, have high quality opportunities to support their development. Every child deserves this. Knowing that one of the key factors for kindergarten readiness is access to quality, quality learning opportunities, let's look more closely at access and affordability to our child, to um, child care in Contra Costa so that we can fully understand why so few children are ready for kindergarten. Next slide. So even before the pandemic prompt, prompted a thousand child care and early learning providers to close, Contra Costa was already in a child care crisis. So a 2017, Granted, this is already um, a few years old. It showed the county was around um, almost 13,000 childcare spaces short in Contra Costa. And you can just imagine the effect this has on families. All too often, it ends up being the women in the household um, who are impacted the most. And really, this current moment has truly amplified this trend with so many women leaving the workforce because their childcare options have evaporated with the pandemic. In fact, we've learned that um, 2.3 million women in the US have left the labor market since the pandemic began. So this shortage really has an economic impact. Before the pandemic, it was estimated that around 57 billion is lost annually in the US because of the gap of childcare for families. We can really only imagine where that stands now. 
And that's just talking about availability. If we look at costs for early learning, the picture, picture is even starker. So we can't talk about the cost of childcare without looking at the full family budget. In Contra Costa, childcare takes up the largest share, followed by housing, food, miscellaneous expenses, healthcare, transportation, and money set aside for emergency savings and taxes. Let's look at this for a second. For a family of four, childcare takes close to one third of their family expenses. The income needed to cover all these expenses, almost 11,000 a month, which means at this point, 45% of families in Contra Costa cannot cover these costs. Something here really has to give. Next slide. So subsidies help. Um, I come from a federal and a state funded program. And I have to say here in Contra Costa, we've done a lot of really important work, um, including um, uh, AB 435 in partnership with um, then Assemblyman Tony Thurman, which um, was a bill that increased eligibility for Contra Costa families. But with the median income still so far below the needs to cover monthly expenses, still the math really doesn't add up. Those who can't make ends meet still don't qualify for a subsidy. So let's not forget about racial disparities in income. So a Latinx resident makes 50 cents and a black, re black resident makes 67 cents to a white resident's dollar. This means that when it comes to making end ends meet, more families of color are the ones who really struggle. So the staggering truth is childcare should cost even more than it does. Childcare in the US, I think we all know it's been undervalued historically. Until women started entering the workforce in the 70s, childcare was the unpaid work of mothers at home. As more women, especially white women, have moved into the workforce, that undervaluing has only transferred to the work of women of color who make up now about 40% of the childcare workforce. This history leads us to low wages for these workers and we're increasingly see, seeing childcare professionals leave the field because they just can't afford to make early learning their careers. Since the pandemic, um, 200,000 uh, child care providers have left the field just in California alone. And we know that now with hazard pay for grocery store workers, oftentimes grocery store clerks make more than early care and education teachers. So the chronic undervaluing has been perpetuated and the perception that the younger the child, uh, the less skilled the work. But quality child care really requires high skilled um, workforce, especially for our youngest. So to have the interaction, curriculum, and environment that creates a quality experience, child care workers absolutely need to be compensated for their value, at least at a minimum on par with kindergarten teachers. In fact, many um, child care programs such as the Federal Head Start program requires bachelor's degree of their lead teachers as well as teaching permits. They need to have health insurance um, and resources to continue with their professional development. Facilities need to be healthy and safe to support a nurturing environment. So often many of the facilities we see are in the basements of churches and other places and really can't, don't optimize children's learning. A recent survey by our partner Coco Kids indicated that 100% of providers in Contra Costa say that their budgets were greatly impacted by the growing demand of COVID-19. So if we are actually paying for all these things, childcare costs rack up to about $4,600 a month for two children. And if you go back to our median income for Contra Costa residents, that would actually be more than half of their income if we looked at the true cost of childcare. Okay, next slide. 
So it's clear that investing in early childhood pays dividends for individuals and communities, but we know that families alone can't be the ones responsible for making these investments. We have a long way to go in coming together as a community to make every, sure every child can reach their full potential. So we can start with increased wages for providers and greater access, more affordability for families. We're excited to see that universal preschool is taking hold in more and more proposed legislation. And it really, it's an important first step. However, there's so much work to do. For example, access and affordability is very critical. We also know from the Heckman curve that infant and toddler early learning is absolutely critically important. And when we um, looked at the um, absence of childcare slots, so many of these in this county are infant and toddler slots. There's such a great need. We need to retain and continue to cultivate a strong childcare workforce. Worthy wages for providers are essential. We also need to take the Take the, um, we need to invest in spaces and facilities that are healthy and optimal for development. So ultimately, we as a society need to value the learning that happens in early childhood as a critical piece of our public infrastructure, at least as a minimum, the way we value the K-12 system, if not more. The returns and critical role in the first five years of life are just simply too high to not make this investment. Um, our children and their families miss out unless we do so. So thank you. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Camilla. I just we did have a we did have um, one question. Elisa put a question in the chat about. Okay. Um, you know, what are some, you know, just looking at it, you know, it's so hard to identify um, spaces to meet these needs and to fulfill all the requirements. And so um, it, can you just speak to that? Let me just read exactly. What are the solutions out there to address the child care gap? And it's okay if you want to pump this to kind of the panel talk. But she says, I remember looking into what it takes to create a physical space for it. And it's not easy. That's right. It's not easy and it shouldn't be because, um, you know, the spaces that we have need to be safe and healthy and they need to meet the needs, low ratios of children and so on, really to have a high quality learning experience. And like I said, it, it costs money. And so that's absolutely true. And, you know, we just, um, we as a society need to look at early care and education as part of our infrastructure so that as we're building buildings, as we're building housing communities, we're thinking about child care as well. We're thinking about making that investment in child care as we do for housing and other critical pieces of our infrastructure. Yeah. Great. No, I mean, it, with the new discussion about uh the care economy being a critical part of the American jobs plan and infrastructure investments. I mean, I think it's important to make sure that we're focused on, on early childhood uh, and child care. So um, great. Well, thank you so much, Camilla. Um, really you. appreciate it. What a great way to start us off. So um, what we're going to do now is um, hear from um, Devorah Levine. Um, and the executive director of the Dean and Margaret Lesher Foundation. Prior to joining the Lesher Foundation, uh, Devorah served as assistant director for Contra Costa County's Employment and Human Services Department, where she led efforts in developing essential partnerships to support families, oversaw government affairs, grants and fund development, and research and evaluation. Um, and she was intimately involved with getting the Contra Costa Equitable Economic Recovery Task Force off the ground. So um, just really appreciate that personally. Um, Devorah is going to speak to the importance of investing in early childhood education and child care um, with, with her new perspective of um, being associated with one of Contra Costa's um, most important foundations. So Devorah, thank you so much for being here. Take it away. Thank you, Kristen. And hi, everyone. I'm glad to be back here with you all. Um, so I'm going to uh, really just add an exclamation point to what Camilla covered, uh, a big exclamation point, and I think uh, uh, pose some questions about what will it really take for us to take seriously 
the premise of investing in children and families and childcare and access to care and early childhood. And the first exclamation point I wanna add is where Camilla ended and Kristen made a comment is really about how we view the work of early childhood and um, what has been called the care economy. Um, I think what's critical in terms of investing, uh, and you'll hear this about what the Lesher Foundation, how the Lesher Foundation has viewed the, our investments, is that to really um, underscore that um, the needs are great in terms of infrastructure, and I think we need to come back to that related to how we view care. Um, I think the pandemic really underscored that um, care work is essential work. It was actually codified and defined during this pandemic, um, but the I'm not sure that our view of that in terms of investment has necessarily shifted. Um, and certainly we haven't caught up to that yet. So that's a dilemma for us to grapple with and a gap. Um, it's really the work, I think it's been said already that, that makes other work possible. Um, most importantly, it develops young brains and helps all of our children thrive and reach their full potential. So who, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> I mean, I, so I think that, but the question is really, it has not shown up in terms of our work in, in, in cash investments, as well as policy work in a way that um, recognizes its importance. Um, so when I think about this task force and the equitable economic recovery, um, I can, I really appreciate that this conversation is happening today to look at um, how we can look at actionable items to um, make that premise a reality. So, um, so we can go to the next slide. So uh, what I want to say a little bit about is when we're thinking about investing, I think, you know, I want to just start broadly to say that one of the questions is always, well, uh, what is what are the conditions that we can invest in? Like what, what is the current state of things in our own county um, and among all of us as um, committed partners? And I just wanted to make a few comments about, um, again, just adding an exclamation point to what Camilla said about what do things look like in our county if, if folks are thinking about investing your time, your energy, policy, dollars. And the first thing, I won't go over the data again, but just to underscore really, that the opportunity gap in our county in terms of access to care and early childhood quality care um, is, is really varies widely across the county, but has been exacerbated because of the pandemic. Um, there were already inequities baked into our systems before the pandemic, and now we are um, dealing with even uh, greater dilemmas as we move forward. Um, this is really how I view it, and especially in my new seat uh, with the Lesher Foundation is, is urgent. Um, and at the same time, I wanna shift to say that the conditions are really ripe for investment, which is really good news. So here are a few things that I've noticed um, that are really critical. I mean, one is that we have really strong structured collaboration, which I think is essential to being able to take action. Um, in terms of early childhood and making a difference with families and children in our county. So that's, I think, a critical piece of positive conditions that exist for investment. Um, we also have parents who are engaged uh, because of some work I'll mention in a bit um, that First Five, Coco Kids, many others have been doing to really get families and parents engaged in um, advocating, but also getting their needs met um, in the county so that children can thrive. Um, so that is, I think, another really positive um, piece. The other thing is that I think many of us know that there are many partnerships underway to address disparities and inequities. And I think that um, this is also an area that cr could create some synergy in terms of investment in early childhood and access to care. Um, there are also a lot of potential possibilities in terms of investment, which I'm sure will probably get discussed today too. For example, Measure X um, and other public funds that are that will be coming into the county. Um, and I think that those are all things that we can certainly all build on in the year and years to come. Okay, so next slide. So, um, 
Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Lindy. So the, the sort of last two pieces I want to mention is really, um, first, I want to say a little bit about um, investments and uh, what one example of investment, which is I want to you know, sort of put our money where our mouth is, that the Lesher Foundation has, um, in, in our commitment, the Lesher Foundation has had a, a very strong commitment to children and families uh, since its inception. And I'm, I'm really um, proud to be a part of the foundation now. And um, in 2019, the Lesher Foundation committed to an early childhood 10-year initiative. Um, and you can see here what the um, goal is, but it was really, the idea was to um, work in partnership with grantees and support other efforts so that um, all children really have a chance to thri a thrive regardless of their family's income level, race, or zip code. And there are basically three areas where the foundation has committed to invest over the next 10 years. One is um, creating opportunity and supporting an infrastructure, particularly in East County, um, related to early childhood. Um, and secondly, to focus on parental engagement. And lastly, to support an enhanced reading culture. So I just want to mention that um, at least the, the Lesher Foundation is very committed to investing both dollars and support to early childhood and access to care um, and uh, plan to continue to do that for um, a long time. Um, so I think the question then is what that begs the question also, what role can philanthropy play? And uh, while the Lesher Foundation is a foundation focused in Contra Costa County, we are joined by other partner um, philanthropists in the county who are focused on early childhood. There is a collaborative focused on early childhood funding, um, which I know has been very effective over the years, uh, working to bring more philanthropy to the table. Um, and I think that that has been essential. But I would also say that there are obviously opportunities both from donors and um, corporations to also play a similar role, which is to be able to fund things that are often unrestricted, um, that need to be unrestricted and allow for innovation um, in places where you know that can't happen because of um, public funds that may be able to assist. So we can go to the left. So, so um, the last thing I guess I want to say is more, yeah, I'm at the end, is to pose a question more about um, what types of investments can be made uh, moving forward, uh, not presupposing any answers. But um, I think that I want to just um, challenge us to be thinking about how we view investments. And one is certainly through dollars and uh, the question of looking at what dollars get priority um, what, what gets priority in terms of investments in our county um, and encouraging others to come to the table to invest in early childhood um, and access to care. Um, I think there, Camilla mentioned quite a few opportunities embedded in her presentation, which is one, you know, to certainly redefine infrastructure, um, how we view it. Um, I think there will be opportunities to look at um, facilities, um, wages, um, and, uh, all, all many policy issues coming up. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Michael Tubbs may offer too in the, by way of um, other innovations that you know, could be considered in our own county. Um, but I'm gonna stop there and just say, I appreciate being part of the conversation and really um, can't say enough how, how critical I think this issue is to having us move forward and have forward momentum in terms of an equitable economic recovery. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Devorah, for, um, for being a part of the conversation and helping to lead on all these important issues. And I think one reason I'm so excited about having Michael Tubbs be, um, be a speaker for us today is his success at pulling philanthropy in to support, you know, and to do that and do the important um, uh, pilot project that I'm sure he'll talk about today um, on providing um, uh, $500 to a subset of families in Stockton and, and the impact that that had on them. Um, so um, what we want to do now is actually I wanted to bring um, uh, Camilla back into the conversation and bring Letty um, uh, Kizan from um, Coco Kids who's on today. I didn't see John on as well, but I know that Letty's here. 
because um, obviously, and Camilla mentioned how you partner with Coco Kids and, and the great work that they've been doing. And it's why we really wanted to make sure they were very much involved in our work on this equitable economic recovery task force. And so Letty, I just wanted to um, ask you to maybe speak first and, um, and, and we can spotlight John, John's here too, um, to, um, just give your get your reactions to what I mean. I know that this is the stuff that you think about all the time, and is certainly um, important to understanding this. But you know, I know that I want to bring employers into the conversation and bring the business community into the conversation to talk about why this is so important. So I just wanted to kind of just pitch to you an opportunity to react um, to what you heard, and and you know, please feel free for one or both of you to share on that from what um, Devora and Camilla talked about, because they touched on so many important things in terms of access, in terms of facilities and providers and costs. But what what else? What's your reaction, and what else would you like to add to the conversation at this point? Oh, I think we need to work on unmuting them. I went and asked you a question and prevented you from speaking. So we're gonna go ahead and um, fix that, but thank you. Uh, gives you a couple extra minutes to noodle on that because um, it really is, is so much to cover. Letty and John, you should both be able to speak. Just okay. mute yourselves. Perfect. All right, so <clears throat> yeah. So uh, thank you, Christine and Lindy. And thank you, Devora and uh, Camila for um, speaking on behalf of the, uh, the needs and, and the challenge of the childcare sector, we at Coco Kids echo everything that was said and, and discussed. A big yay, yes. <laughs> and what I just wanted to add is, um, in, 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 in addition to what were already current challenges before the pandemic on the childcare sector, the pandemic really just worsened it and really. Uh, brought to light um, a, a, a child care sector that is really about to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, it, one thing that the, one good thing that the pandemic did was to really highlight the important role of child care in, in, in a public health crisis like we are having right now. And, um, but, the, but the crisis also brought some more problems. Um, in addition to the, the current problems that they already have, there was the reduced enrollment, the, the reduced um, income, and then the increased costs of being compliant with the new health and safety guidelines. So they needed more, you know, they needed more money to spend on uh, the PPEs and the cleaning supplies. And the social distancing guidelines also impacted on their income because, you know, you can, you can only have X number of children because of the social distancing guidelines. So, Apart from the current problems already, the pandemic just layered on more problems. And so, and it just really worsened the childcare crisis that the country is going on right now. So um, we are really also uh, trying to uh, see and explore many, many ways of trying to solve this, but um, we know that we need um, everyone to be in the table to kind of solve this. Yeah. John, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, you know, once again, you know, Devorah, I've been working with Devorah and Camilla for years on this, this issue. And I, and I think the bright side is, is we know how to make, ch help children um, succeed. Mm -hmm. We know all the ingredients to do this really well. Um, one of the biggest challenges, you know, uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, Lisa was asking uh, about, how, about facilities, it is going to require a significant investment, just the way we think about our infrastructure now. You know, with all the investments the federal government is putting into the infrastructure, we need to include schools and child care facilities on the same level. Um, right now, we don't prioritize early childhood the way we think of public schools. Right. I think as a society, we have accepted that it is our collective best interest to educate our children. But for some reason, we have it stuck in our head that it only applies between the ages of five and 18, right. that everybody's on their own after 18 and everybody's on their own before the age of five. Now, if we want to really build a strong workforce, we would focus more on, on the zero to five and the 18 to 20, you know, making sure people can get secondary education. So it's almost like we have to do a paradigm shift to kind of adjust mm -hmm. our thinking to realize that as a society, it's in our best collective interest to put all of our efforts 
toward creating a stronger workforce moving forward. And then the second thing is that the, the, our, our, our current environment has changed dramatically, you know, economically, even business-wise. Um, we are no longer a nine to five society that we're actually, you know, uh, because of the gig economy and all the other things going on. And childcare doesn't necessarily meet the needs of people who work late evening work mm -hmm. or even weekends. So that's where we see the biggest gap that in order for businesses to thrive, they're, they're on, a, uh, on an adjusted schedule now. They're not, it's not as easy for them to uh, uh, just, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's not a nine to five world anymore. Um, so that's where we see some of the biggest childcare gaps is after hours, weekends, uh, where, where people really need the support. Um, so if we can kind of shift our thinking in terms of accepting our collective responsibility for educating young children, and then we kind of look at what is our workforce need. And, and, and I, I have my third thing out here is, don't forget that the primary caregiver for children is still the parents. Mm -hmm. And the parents are, the, the, the better we can make it for them to actually go out, earn a living and come home and care for their, their kids, the better we will be. So as an employer, you kind of have to think about, well, what can I do for my current employees to help them with their childcare needs? And I think for some co companies, it's easy because they can offer flexible hours. Mm -hmm. They can, they, you know, they can even provide some kind of stipend or support their 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 employees in taking advantage of uh, several childcare tax credits. Um, but you know, it, it's as long as the parents are still the primary caregiver, it's in our, also in our best interest to, to making sure our employees are able to fulfill their responsibilities and and care for their kids. So. How can I adjust my workforce uh, so we can accommodate those things? I love thinking about a paradigm shift because I think that's absolutely what it's gonna take. I mean, I know, right? One of the hats I wear is as a school board member and one of the keys to making our distance learning program work as well as it did was providing camp for the, the K to six children. Now we, we didn't become a child care provider for the zero to five, but we did hire a responsible adults to supervise the learning for those TK to six kids that were in school and needed some supervision. And I know that not every school district was able to do that. And, you know, I, and I recognize all the equity issues that are there. Um, but I do think this paradigm shift, um, you know, because it, it's not as though we have, it'd be fun to vision with all of you about exactly what that would look like, but it'd be very, it's very different than other countries do it. You know, we are, um, I've talked a lot and, and partly was inspired to go into policy work because we're so hostile to families in what we expect. And as you said, really eloquently, John, from zero to five, you're on your own and 18 and above, you're on your own. And there are huge workforce ramifications for that. Um, and so I love that we're at, you know, that, I, that you talked about the bright side and this potential investment that we can all make. Um, so in terms of thinking about, and I'll, and I'll get to you, you, you I, just want, I am gonna ask you the magic wand question that I often ask people if you've been gone to my event. So I am gonna give you all power in a moment. So you can think about what, what you would do with that power. Um, but in terms of, of, of a follow-up question, I wanted to um, think about um, how we can um, best support, I wanna, I, I wanna focus on the childcare workforce itself for a minute. And, you know, you talked about 100, you know, that um, there was a reference to the, uh, Camilla mentioned the Coco Kids study about that 100% of childcare providers were impacted budget-wise. Um, and, and Letty followed up in their comments about the COVID-19 pandemic. But in terms of, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we can best support the development of the early childhood education workforce. You know, Camilla, you touched on the need for professional development and good wages and benefits and things, um, but would love for each of you to, to bring your take on how we can best support um, that the early childhood education workforce itself. And I will just let you jump in. Camilla, you unmuted. Okay. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I can start. Um, so, uh, the um, state has released um, the master plan for education. It's a, it's a you know, robust, um, really sort of exciting plan that's a 10 year plan. And, um, and so one of those pieces around that is really 
um, supporting um, teachers through sort of a tiered system of compensation um, built around competencies and development. And, and really it encourages teachers monetarily to continue with their education. And that's wonderful. And that's, it's an excellent plan. And um, like many of the pieces of the master plan, there aren't a lot of funds attached to it. And so, you know, it's, it's again, like a robust, exciting, ambitious plan, but until we put some real dollars towards um, those ideas around like a tiered compensation and supporting teachers for, you know, inclusion training so that they can really support children with um, dual language learning mm -hmm. and disabilities and so on, really supporting them in a way that, um, that you know, compensates them for this learning, I think is really important. And then, you know, I know you asked about development, but, but then again, I do just want to go back to worthy wages. And, you know, that the average salary I think I showed is 14, mm -hmm. 42 an hour. And, um, you know, a, a, a teacher in the K-12 system would not ever make that much money. <laughs> I mm -hmm. you know, especially not here in California. And so um, it's, it really is about professionalizing teachers. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a profession. And so until we compensate them in that way, it, it still will not be seen as, as a profession. Right, we have to create the right incentives. John, did you wanna jump in on that question as yeah, well? Well, I, I, would, I echo what Camilla says 100% because I, th I think it boils down to two things, you know, compensation and respect. Um, if you look at other industries that lose people, you know, nursing is one. My, my wife was a, a nurse and, and I could tell you people left that field because they didn't feel respected and because they didn't feel fairly compensated for the long hours they were put in. I think early childhood is no different. People enter this field with a good heart. What I love about teaching and working with kids is everybody who enters the field loves children and want to do their best for children. Somehow, as a as a society, we beat that out of them. Right. <laughs> and and I think if you know, so if we if we're happy with having people in the field for you know two to three years, then don't change a thing. But if you want to have a stronger system where people are invested and become career oriented, you have to look at compensation. You have to look at their ability to to grow within the field. That that means you know. What, where, where, what areas of learning do they have available to them to, to mm -hmm. professionalize it? And then we just have to respect it more. You know, it, it's, these are the people raising our children and, and uh, I can't think of a, a greater field to respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I can just add, Kristen, um, I was just in a meeting last week with the three community colleges. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I was so pleased to hear that their early care and education classes are full. Um, right. which is wonderful. However, the, the, the deans were saying that the um, students aren't actually working in the field because they can't afford it. Um, so, you know, there's this great interest in it. People mm -hmm. feel passionate about it. However, they're not actually getting jobs within that field because they can't afford to in this county. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, like with so many things, right, the high cost of housing is such an impediment in terms of what people can choose because they they might really find joy and meaning in early child care and that's why they're pursuing those classes. But if they're, they can't be working in it because they can't afford it, we've got a problem. Letty, I just saw you unmute yourself. Did you want to add to that? Yes, I, I wanted to add my personal experience about that related to, to wages and the income. Um, when I, I have my personal um, journey through that, after I, um, uh, when I was uh, about to have my son, and I, so I read up on a lot of, you know, how to raise children, uh, intelligent and productive mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and children, and so, because I didn't take that in college. There's no such thing as a parenting one-on-one in college. Right. And the more I educated myself about that, the more I wanted to put up my own um, childcare you know, facility. And I say, I'm going to you know, implement the, 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 the policies, the philosophy that I have learned. And so I, I, did, I, I started to, you know, apply to become a child care um, provider facility. But as I did the math, <laughs> or just simple arithmetic, 
I didn't see any, um, you know, any possibility or, or, of uh, really gaining something or really um, making uh, money or even just a decent profit from it. And so mm -hmm. I just got this, uh, you know, I, the incentive wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so what more, you know, and that's why I feel how our providers or even potential childcare providers are really feeling. They get into the field, they enter the field, they get their degrees, but coming out, they, they, it, it's not a viable uh, job or a viable um, profession to, you know, to be able to, to, that is sustainable. It's not really, right. it's not that sustainable. So our wages, I think, are, are prime and, and critical. And, um, I just want to one thing that, that I think all of us, you know, all businesses rely on relationships with vendors in order to support their business. They have to buy products from mm -hmm. other places. And childcare is really no different. It's one more vendor you need to have your employees at work to do a really good job. So you kind of have to think of the scope of that is what are all the resources I need to run my business and uh, childcare should be right on that list. Yeah, absolutely. And in so many uh, employers that I talk to, think about on-site childcare as the gold standard that they would love to figure out how to do because of all the benefits of of parents and employees having access to their kids on site. And, um, you know, I know, um, you know, I used, to, I used to work at a big New York law firm, which is not an easy life to be a parent in, but one of our benefits was emergency backup childcare. So they were there in case, like, so if, you're, if your caregiver got sick or your child is sick or something that you needed to keep working, um, but that was even hard to access because it was often full, you know, so it was one of those, so anyway, there's there's so many challenges here. So um, and I appreciate letting you, you sharing your own experience about like you get prepared, you're excited about the opportunity, you have all these great ideas, and then you think about all the costs that's involved, and the math just doesn't add up. So we as a society need to make the math add up. Um, so building on that, in, in thinking about um, the um, you know. You, Camilla mentioned the, the master plan for early learning and care, and we, we put a link to it in the chat. Um, so there, the, um, the county's pilot sliding scale programs um, are suggested, you know, doing, doing a, a sliding scale program um, is, is part of that, you know, as you think about the, this issue of too many people don't make enough to, um, to um, afford all the costs associated with it. Um, do most providers in our area offer a sliding scale? And um, I, I, and would you support expanding it? I'm assuming you, you would, but um, anyway, do you wanna comment about sliding scale as a, as a specific tool to help, help families deal with the cost and help providers? John, you may wanna take this one as the r, &R. <laughs> well, well, I can tell you most providers um, receive, if they're accepting kids who are eligible for a subsidy, mm -hmm. um, they're often accepting that subsidy that is built on the family's income. Mm -hmm. So often families will have a parent fee attached to it. Uh, so, the, and so that's the sliding scale. We're not asking providers to take less, right. um, but they may depend upon the family to provide more depending on right. their need. Um, the challenge with this is a lot of times our providers build their, their, uh, their rates based on what they believe their families can afford. So a provider in Pittsburgh isn't necessarily charging Danville rates, you know, they're, 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 they're meaning. So in a way, they're kind of shortchanging themselves, providing the same level of service, um, but they just know their, their particular clientele wouldn't come to them unless it was more affordable. So that's part of the affordability and the, the access issue. Okay. Um, so, so right now, there, there may be some providers who are doing a sliding scale that's not, not necessarily something that's built into our system. Um, for those who qualify for a subsidy, we're able to provide as much as we can based on their income. Um, and I think that's as close to the sliding scale as you were asking about. Okay. Oh, that's helpful to understand. I mean, um... I uh, was astounded to learn, I mean, sort of in a different context, right? I mean, subsidies exist across all different sectors. Um, and so, you know, I was astounded to find out, you know, that the, the, the waiting list for a section eight voucher was, you know, thousands and thousands of names long, but then, right. And there's always this struggle of get finding landlords that will accept those vouchers. So anyway, we, we have to get better at all of this. 
um, yeah. to help families. Yeah, um, just understand the cost of care is pretty yeah. much universal. It costs right. the same to raise a child, no matter where you are in this county. Um, yeah. So it's it's really putting those resources and and in in communities of high income, that comes with some advantages, so they can add a little bit more to make those environments better. And right. communities of low income, they're more at a disadvantage. You know, they can't add those extras to there. Um, so, but the, the cost of raising the child is pretty much universal. Right, right. That's so important. Okay, so we we are um, we only have about um, eight minutes before we're going to want to take our break, and it's totally unfair to give each of you just two minutes to wave your magic wand. But the scenario I want you to imagine um, is that you are all powerful. You are all powerful locally in Contra Costa. You are all pow powerful as a citizen of California and as a you know a resident of the United States of America. So you are all powerful at all levels of government. And what would you want to see happen to, to make all of this better for our kids? Um, and so I will go ahead and impose on my good friend, Devora. I will call on Devora first to answer this question um, to bring into this conversation. So be all powerful. What do you wanna see happen? I was gonna say, if I was all powerful, I'd bring John and Camilla and Letty. And <laughs> so that's where I was gonna start. Um, you know, I would, if I were all powerful, I would uh, make sure that there was a paradigm shift and insist on it. I mean, I think that's been said a few times, which is I would flip the underlying assumptions about um, care mm -hmm. and how it's valued, mm -hmm. how we view care for children, mm -hmm. supporting parents. So I would start there. Um, and then because I know my colleagues are gonna fill this in, I'll just say that from a 30,000 foot level, if I were all powerful, I would also um, flip investments. So for example, I would do both. I would uh, do two things. One, I would invest heavily in, an, in a care infrastructure. I mean, you know, I would, I would work to inspire philanthropy to continue investing. I would work to inspire uh, public funds to, um, be allocated in ways that have never been allocated as Camilla pointed out with the master plan that there are actually dollars behind a lot of the really positive um, concrete actions that are being proposed. Um, but the other thing I would do is also look at um, poverty reduction. So I think there is a, a you know, I know that there, it's hotly debated, I won't go into the studies, but whether or not there's a correlation or causation, but I would say that to me, what's critical is empowering families. So meaning lift families agency to be able to afford care and be a full, you know, be present as a parent or kin, et cetera, as well as have an infrastructure at the same time. So that would right. be my broad view of things. Okay. And then I will leave it to my inspired colleagues to be all powerful. Tell me. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, John, I'm going to talk to, I'm going to impose on you next. You're all powerful. Wave your magic wand. You know, once I, I heard someone give us that once that if uh, we invested just 5% of our prison budget in early childhood, we'd be able to do all the things that we want to do. Um, so if I was all powerful, I would make a major shift on what we prioritize in this world. Like Devorah said, like I said earlier, um, we just have to shift our thinking. And to kind of make this full circle, just understand as closer I approach old, old age, I realize that the people I'm going to depend on in my senior years are these children, you know, mm -hmm. as adults. So I want these children to be the best caretakers I could possibly raise because I'm the person they're going to be taking care of. Um, if I was all powerful, I, I would, I would, you know, I, I would do everything Devorah said, plus, um, you know, I think increase, actually, I would, I would like for us all to always start every conversation with how does this impact children? If we start there, I think we will all be in a better space. You know, it's just, if we do right by these children, I think we're going to do right by ourselves. So that's, that's my simple answer. Excellent. Letty, you want to build on that? Sure. So aside from what Devorah and John said, which I all agree, if um, I were all powerful, uh, first I would look at 
um, whatever I do or implement from an equity lens, because I think that um, the problems um, in childcare can really um, start with looking at the gaps, right? The opportunity gaps, you know, and, and, the, and the gaps in access. So um, um, when you look at it from that lens, then I would um, make, you know, early childhood educators earn the same money as their counterparts, you know, in, in higher education. I would give access uh, to child, more access to more access and more equitable access to uh, child care. Mm -hmm. And I would probably have a, a quality child care program in every workplace that mm -hmm. I can have. And, um, and I also would uh, look at the, speaking of the care economy, uh, the pandemic also brought about uh, the fact that uh, we, we, with, the, with the work at, uh, at home and essential workers working, uh, they have had to also have their children cared for by um, friends, families, and neighbors. So we, I would put also um, some uh, a focus or attention to that, um, mm -hmm. educating them and supporting these, uh, what we call FFN, the friends, families, and neighbors, so that they can also be mm -hmm. part of the care economy mm -hmm. and, be supported, and be supported and recognized as well. And I, th that company or my initiative would all involve all of these people. I would hire Camilla, Deborah, <laughs> Christine, and make Christine and Lindy our advisors. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. That's yeah. wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, so Camilla, I'm gonna give you, um, give the magic one last. Okay. Well, I absolutely agree with everything everyone said. Um, and John, you know, I have to say your comment around investing in prisons, I just finished the book by Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy. And so I want to echo that, everything you've said around that. But for me, you know, I've been in this field a long time, really since I was a teenager. And I feel, I, I feel optimistic. I feel that, you know, the past five years, the stars are starting to align. I feel like right now, um, our government is, is really wanting to prioritize and invest in early care and education. Mm -hmm. I feel like our governor is there. We have a legislator that's supportive. So I feel like the plans are starting to come together. I think, you know, the magic wand for me is the investment. Mm -hmm. The plans are there. The ideas are there. Um, the right people are at the tables giving input, you know, First Five Association, I know, you know, the, the R&R networks, California Head Start, all of the right table people are at the table. Um, it's just a matter of investing the right dollar amount. So you can't, you can't have, you know, grandiose plans and then put, you know, a couple of dollars towards it and hope that the rest will just somehow work itself out. Um, so I think, you know, my magic wand would be putting forth the dollars, the hard decisions that, that put the dollars that are absolutely needed to make this system work. Um, yeah. No, that's, I mean, it's great to think about the paradigm shift and the resources to go with it to make it happen. Just real fast before we do go um, take a little bit of a break before our, um, our keynote speaker joins us. So Tamina put a great question in the chat. Which, what countries, if any, do this well? Like do this better? Like who should we be emulating, if anybody? Um, you know, I, I think it depends on what we're looking at. So right. there's a lot of countries that are doing it better than us. Yeah. Um, if anybody doing extremely well, I think all of us could do better. Yeah. Um, if we just look at how we treat uh, babies and, and mothers, Iceland does it better already. You know, um, you know, they give mothers, I think, up to a year home, you know, mm -hmm. their kids paid. Um, there, are, there are ways to do this better than what we're doing now. Um, so so I, the answer to your question, yes, there's a list, and um, but everybody could probably still raise their game. Right, right. Um, and, you know, we've got Denmark suggested in the chat, you know, there are countries in this world where um, there is a quality childcare setting in every neighborhood and that it's understood that everybody's babies go there, right? which leads to some um, economic mixing and a lot of great things that are, are um, uh, potentially really beneficial. So um, 
So I did, um, I don't ever want to cut anybody off. Um, but I do want to just appreciate the really substantial, um, information that you took us through this morning, um, in terms of starting with your presentation, Camilla, and just talking about all the building blocks and thinking about the, you know, the power grid of early, early minds and what we need to do and thinking about that with as a metaphor for building a house and what that looks like. And, um, and Devorah talking about the role of philanthropy and the opportunity gaps and how we need to work together and, and change this. And then Letty and John just certainly bringing in your experience and talking about the, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we need this paradigm shift in order to, um, and to really think about how to provide this resource that's essential to the economy and making everything else possible. And so just definitely wanna offer myself as a partner in all of this and, and certainly know that we're just, you know, we are what feels like at this special moment. And so wanting to figure out how to take action and support action that helps us move in, in a good direction. So um, it's 1022, our idea was to get at least an eight minute break in. Um, and so I know that I am sometimes horrible at this and literally not taking a moment to take care of myself going zoom to zoom to zoom. And so um, just wanna thank our uh, presenters and um, have everyone just know that we're gonna go ahead and take a break, but you know, you can walk away from your screen, you can go do what you need to do, um, but we're, we're gonna continue on this same link at 1030 um, where I'll be introducing Michael Tubbs. So um, thank you so much. What a great, what a great discussion. Really, really appreciate you. So um, we'll get started again at 1030. Thanks everybody. Um, well, uh, by my clock, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is 1030. So um, we will go ahead and, and get started. Our keynote speaker is here. We are recording this. Um, but just want to welcome back from the break uh, for our convening here um, at the Ethical Economic Recovery Task Force, um, where we just had a terrific panel. But now we're going to um, start our keynote. So um, Michael Tubbs wears many hats, um, and we're excited that he's our keynote speaker today. Um, he's a, a new special advisor for economic mobility and opportunity for Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, he's the founder of Mayors for Guaranteed Income. Um, he was elected mayor of his hometown of Stockton in 2016, becoming the youngest mayor in Stockton's history and its first African-American mayor, uh, where he served in this role from 2017 to 2021. Um, he also served as a member of the Stockton City Council, uh, representing the sixth district uh, from 2013 till 2017. I am gonna acknowledge that he is a graduate of the outstanding, I admit I'm biased, the outstanding um, international baccalaureate program at Franklin High School. Um, Mr. Tubbs attended Stanford University after that. Uh, he graduated in 2012 with a BA in Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity and a Master's in Policy, Leadership and Organization Studies. Um, he has many, many awards that I could list, but I don't wanna make him uncomfortable. And I first uh, met uh, uh, in real life, not online, in real life, back <laughs> pre-pandemic. I met Michael Tubbs at, at an event we were both at at the Presidio Institute where I felt compelled to introduce myself because I had just met a young person who then was um, finishing their uh, uh, sophomore year in that IB program at Franklin. And just um, and it was actually uh, their experience in volunteering for on um, Mayor Tubbs' campaign that, that brought them to my attention. Um, and uh, this person is now my, has been my mentee ever since and um, is a sophomore at Stanford now. And so um, still really, um, proud of being, of learning all the great things about Franklin High School that I have learned through this relationship. So um, he's made some recent, Michael Tubbs has made recent news, not just because of his appointment um, by Gavin Newsom, but because about this pilot that has rightly garnered a lot of national attention um, that he helped to start with the support of philanthropy um, in Stockton, um, providing um, a very modest amount of money um, to a, a number of families and there are um, really great outcomes from that work. So I'm sure he'll touch upon that today. So we have um, about 45 minutes of uh, Mr. Tubbs time today. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our keynote speaker and is excited about your presentation. And you know, I have about a million questions. So at whatever point you are, you know, I wanna hear what you uh, kind of what you're thinking about and what you wanna focus on. But we're, um, we are truly very interested in Contra Costa in how to improve economic mobility and think that you're a really great person to be hearing from. So thank you for joining us. Well, Kristen, thank you for that far too kind introduction. And 
it's always weird giving speeches, sitting down. I actually have actual pants on today, but usually I'm like in shorts or swim trunks. And so, it, so I would love to just talk for a little bit and spend most of the time in Q and A. Also, because I think there's a lot of questions I have and a lot of questions the governor's team has about sort of region specific approaches and how can the state better partner with some of the collective impact work being done throughout the state. Um, understanding that there's ma macro things that are um, similar about the micro level. There's a lot of regional differences and variations and how can this huge slow thing called state government actually account for those things. Um, but so honored to be here with you all it's with great humility um, I'm in this conversation because I know many of you have been doing this work for almost as long as I've been alive. If, if I used to be able to say for a long time I've been alive, but now I have some gray hair, I'm 30, so now it's almost as long as, as I've been alive. And, and I just want to say just the conversations that were happening before COVID-19, I think really illustrate that you all were in it for the right reasons, right? And I think if anyone's not having this conversation during COVID-19, are they asleep? What's wrong with them? Because this is really the path forward, not just for folks who are struggling, but for our, for our communities, for, for, for everyone, that, that the, the, to move forward, to build back better means to really reckon with all the ways the systems were broken in, in, in the past. And the fact that you guys were already doing this before a pandemic gives me great hope. Um, as mentioned, I'm, my name is Michael Tubbs. I was born and raised in Stockton, California. When we talk about economic mobility, when we talk about economic opportunity, these aren't things I first learned while mayor of Stockton or as a council member for the city of Stockton or studied at Stanford. There are things I lived and personally experienced. And, and I say that because I think oftentimes when we have these conversations about why some people are able to quote unquote make it and some people aren't without sort of the context of realizing that in the United States today, our economic mobility rates are, are some of the lowest of all developed nations that in, the, in about 19 countries in this world, it's better off to be born a poor child than in America. And that's not even taken into account for race. Because if you look at sort of the, the economic mobility um, opportunities for, for Black youth or Latinx youth or Southeast Asian youth, it's actually worse than many of the countries we, we, we look down upon. And, and I was a child just like that. I was born in poverty. My mother, she was a child, a teenager when I was born. She was 16 years old when she was pregnant, 17, year old, 17 years old when she had me. My father was 17 years old um, when, I, when I was born as well. And, and Stockton's a great city, it's a city that raised me, but structurally there, there, there are a lot of, lot of barriers. There's, there's low wages, um, there's lack of educational attainment. There's not a fully articulated standard of care for early childhood centers. We have folks doing amazing early child care work as grandmothers, as abuelas, as aunties, as cousins, doing what they can, um, but, but not necessarily with, with the academic rigor um, that, that, that I'm now looking for for my 18 year, 18 month old as I we put him in, into child care. But growing up in Stockton taught me so much. And it really taught me that the issue with the economy isn't with the people. It's literally with the economy. <laughs> the, the issue with, I'm going to say that again. The, and I kind of think we oftentimes start with solutions based off deficits in people. So we think about what program, what train, and not saying those things aren't important, but just growing up poor, I realized the issue wasn't with poor people. It was with poverty, scarcity in, in the economy. And I say that because my mom is the hardest working person I saw in my life. My mom worked incredibly hard all the time, really worked herself to death. My mom worked all, she was single. So the first thing she had to do was figure out sort of what was she would put me in childcare. And she would have loved the opportunity to stay at home and, and raise me and nurture me and bond with me, but unfortunately wasn't able to do so. But then didn't even make enough money with which to put me in some of the best preschools or childcare in, 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 in the city. So she found grandmothers from our church who, who like, and luckily for me, the grandmother at my church was someone who had been an educator, was someone who had been trained in education and was someone who felt her ministry, that part of her calling on earth while being retired was to op operate a subsidized childcare center with, with sort of curriculum, with, with um, rigor, with, with assignments, with, with, with structure. 
But that was by happenstance. That, that was by, we were lucky enough that this one woman in our community happened to go to our church. And I start there because it's made such a world of difference. We know what the research says about kind of zero to three and that being the most important point to intervene, that being the most important time to combat inequality, that being the most important time to combat the way that cortisol and, and, and the way poverty affects cortisol and, and infant brain development. And luckily for me, my 16 year old mother found a child care provider that was affordable, that took her child care voucher, but also provided structure and rigor. So that I was reading, I knew my alphabet, I knew my colors, I knew all these things before kindergarten. And because of that, school has always been easy. And I used to think it's because I'm like, I'm just born smart. But <laughs> I realized I was lucky enough to have that level of investment. And I think we're all gathered on this call today because while we can be happy about sort of what our children are able to get and our grandchildren are able to get by way of early education and what we've been able to get, but we also know it's a travesty that that's not standard. We also know that that's actually a, a huge failure on, be, uh, on behalf of all of us that it takes luck and chance or money for kids to get what we know they need for their brains to develop that has impacts 20 plus years later in adulthood and impacts even the societies and communities which we live in. So I was very, very lucky to be in, in a really good early childhood care center. Um, but, in, but I also just saw that my mom's, no matter how hard she worked, she didn't necessarily make more money. Right, and, and that sounds so basic, but I've been in so many debates with people about how people are poor because they're lazy. That if people just worked harder, if people put in the effort, then of course they would have wages to pay for rent. Well, in Contra Costa County, minimum wage doesn't pay for the average one bedroom apartment. You can work incredibly hard <laughs> in your job and still not have enough to make basic necessities. Same in Stockton, same in 99% of counties in this country, irregardless of effort, irregardless of hours, you don't make enough to pay for basic necessities for yourself, for your children, et cetera. And I would see her work herself to death. And I also saw that she was so stressed and so anxious. And I love my mom, amazing woman. But being so young with all the pressure, sometimes she wasn't able to show up as a parent in, in the ways that research says kids need. Sometimes she was stressed, so she yelled. Sometimes she was angry, so or sometimes she was tired, or like she didn't just she didn't have enough, so she wasn't able. She did an amazing job, but she could have done an even better job with a with, with a little bit a little bit of help, a more of a, 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 well, like an income floor, etc. And it's from those experiences that when I became mayor, I, I I decided to do the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration, um, and part of it came from in college reading Dr. King. And in 1967, Dr. King wrote in Where Do We Go From Here? I'm now convinced the simplest way to abolish poverty is the most direct, a guaranteed income pay gap to national media and income. But he, the, how he came to that conclusion, I found very interesting. I think many of you will, it will resonate with. He said that he spent the last decade in the civil rights movement. And he said, I've tried to fight poverty by fighting housing. And he said, now housing is important, and housing is a solution to housing issues, but housing probably isn't the solution to poverty. Then he said, I did the same thing with education, the same thing with healthcare. And he said, I'm now convinced that the simplest way to abolish poverty is the most direct, a guaranteed income paid at the national median income. Now, I remember reading that as a college student and being kind of confused because I spent every Dr. King day being Dr. King, like doing a speech, doing a play, doing an essay. Like, and I had never once heard anyone grapple with this part of his legacy. I heard about his dream. I heard about Selma and Birmingham and Albany and the Nobel Peace Prize and anti-war. I had never even heard any discussion about King and the guaranteed income. So I thought that was fascinating. Fast forward eight years later, I'm mayor of Stockton. And again, as a council member, we were doing things in housing, education, create this whole collective impact model called Reinvent South Stockton Coalition. We had results and indicators across five result areas from housing to public health to um, education to early childhood education to employment and had metrics and had a rigorous term the curve exercise by which we identified and evaluated what we were doing and whether it was working. All that work was important. 
but many of the structural issues were still there. So when I became mayor, I called my team in the room. I said, listen, we are running a rat race. We are working incredibly hard and we're seeing some results. We have people like Princess that, 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 that Christian mentioned, a brilliant young woman from South Stockton in poverty, first generation American, Southeast Asian, who is a brilliant co-leader scientist person who's at Stanford, but there's also like thousands of other kids in the same city that weren't have done themselves at the same, or weren't able to take advantage of, of some opportunities. So I said, find me a policy, not a program, a policy. And, and I, and I want to pause there for a little bit, because I think oftentimes in our desire to do and to see the need and to respond to the need, we revert to programs which are important, but I would argue they're necessary, but not sufficient. And that the response for a lot of things we're talking about are actually, in my opinion, and maybe it's because I just spent the last eight years in government, but they're policy responses. They require a policy. And I say that because policy is the only thing that touches things at scale. I've done a lot, of, spent a lot of time with philanthropy. I spent a lot of time running programs, starting programs, funding programs, and, and they all are important for the impact they make on individual lives. I'm a byproduct of a bunch of programs from that daycare center to magnet programs to after school program, like all those things, the bake programs, public speaking programs, all those things were so important to my development, but they do not, still aren't substitutes for the work of government, for the work of society, which is policy, which is rules, which is laws. So I told my team, I said, listen, get me some policy. And they're like, why policy? And I said, well, my belief is that policy created the conditions we're now fighting against. So if policy is the cause for the extreme disparities, if poverty is the cause for the lack of economic mobility and opportunity in our city, if policy is the cause, then policy has to be part of the solution. And we'll keep doing the programs. We have a scholarship program. We have a childhood savings account program. We have all those things. We're trying to make those programs policies, but we also need a policy. So they came back with this idea of a guaranteed income. And this is my first, that was my first year as mayor. And I was thinking, I don't want this to be my last year as mayor. <laughs> so I said, maybe we'll do this in term two. Pause, thank God I didn't wait to term two because there, there, was, there was no term two, right? <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time. I thought we reelected, I had time. But the next week I ended up being in a conversation with the philanthropy group Economic Security Project. They said they were looking for a city to test guaranteed income with. And I said, oh, we have a task force working on that. And that's literally how the Stockton pilot came together. We spent a year researching, deep listening with community and came up with this idea that let's test and see if something as small as $500 could make a difference for people. And the results just came out in March. And again, there's no magic bullets, there's no panacea, but there are kind of policy solutions that get us to the world we want to live in. And I argue the data suggests that guaranteed income is one of them. For one, we saw that folks who received a guaranteed income were able to transition at two times the rate as those who didn't from part-time employment to full-time employment. And a lot of people say half, but when you think about sort of if you're working an hourly job or a part-time job, you don't have paid time off. So even to interview for a job you may be qualified for requires you taking time off that's not paid. If you live paycheck to paycheck, you don't have the capacity to take a risk on a job you might not get when you know you will get a bill at the end of the month and you know you have just enough money in the status quo. And, and, and so you're stuck and, 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 and you're trapped. And we heard from countless people that the $500 allowed them to take a couple hours off to interview for jobs they were qualified for, for jobs they met, met their requirements for, but they just have the ownership of time to take advantage of it. We also heard from people, and I was shocked by this, that the $500 was enough for them to buy interview clothes, to buy clothes that are, that are appropriate for the, for the job you want to apply to. And I remember feeling so disconnected or privileged when I was shocked by that. I was like, wow, to think you can't interview for a job you're qualified for because you don't want to max out, you don't want to use your credit card to, to buy, you know, like clothes for your interview. 
We also saw, and this is important for the conversation around parenting, that the guaranteed income made people better parents. One guy, Tomas, who told me how he used the $500 the first month to move from part-time to full-time work, six months later, we, we asked him, like, how's it been going? And he said, I know my kids better. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, well, I'm less stressed. I work less hours. I'm home more. And he said, I realized that one of my kids really likes science. And I was like, he said, how, how? He said, I just spend more time with them. And I realize they're interested in nature and soil. So I've been able to take them to the aquarium. I've been able to put them in little science caps. I've been, and he said, I had no idea my child had an interest in science because I'm just stressed and anxious and working. And we heard this from countless people. The idea that some of the issues with what we see in, in parenting and how people may show up as parents isn't because they don't want to be good parents. It also isn't because they don't know how to be good parents. It's because they don't have the ability to breathe, to look at their kids, to listen to their kids talk and, and dream and, and, and explore because they're so busy about providing for their kids. And as a parent of a, I'm surprised he hasn't run in here yet, honestly. He was at the door earlier. <laughs> As a parent of a very rambunctious 18-month-old and another one on the way, I realized that the greatest privilege I have is the ability to take time off whenever I want to listen, to play, to learn. And I know my child very, very well. And I'm able to do things for, for, for my child, not because I'm a better parent, because I have resources. I have, I have the ability to do so. And I think that's been one of the biggest lessons for me is that a, 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 a guaranteed income or an income floor just allows people to do the things we need them to do. And the most important role, as we know, in society is that of parent. And, and what's, also, what's fascinating to me in the pilot, and again, this is, comes from a disconnect, it's just how much, and you all know this, but how much of caregiving work is not compensated. That for, if you make minimum wage and you make about $24,000 a year, to put your child in childcare is about $24,000 a year. So it actually makes sense to not leave the home. Like why work at Amazon or McDonald's to give all the money for someone else to watch your kid when you could do that yourself? But it's fascinating to me because it's, it, it's not compensated. And, and, and selfishly, I would say during COVID, because my wife had a book that came out, I would do 10, 14, 16, 18 hours a week being mayor with my son while, while being mayor. And I think that work should have been paid because that was some of the toughest, that was tougher than mask ordinances. That was tougher than council. That was some, I, was, I, I would dread sometimes like, oh shoot. He just woke up from his nap. I got him for the next three hours. <laughs> and, 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 and there's people, particularly women, who do that work each and every day, not because they can, but they have to. And that work isn't compensated. And, and that's why I think guaranteed income is also a feminist solution in terms of paying folks for the labor in the, of the most important. And it's, it's wild to me, Kristen, because this literally is, the most important job of society. Like the most important job of society is that a parent and folks are doing that full time and not being compensated for it. And they're all women who do it. it, 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 it it's, it's, it's entirely crazy. Um, and, and, and that's why this moment we're in now is so exciting because we have an administration that recognizes that caregiving is work, that we have to elevate the status of caregivers, that we have to do what we can to raise the, the, the status and the pay of folks who do caregiving within their home through this childhood tax credit, which is going to be monthly, which they're trying to make permanent. And for all intents and purposes, it's literally a guaranteed income for families with children. Um, and, 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 and that's a huge step forward for this country. The work around sort of the child care system in, in general, and how we make sure that folks are, are given the access to, to, to the training and education to be world-class caregivers of young children? How do we make sure we have a child care? Like, we only have a child care system. So how do we make sure we have a real child care system? And we saw the stories in COVID-19 of, of, and 
this is a conversation a little bit disconnected from this, but, but not as much in that we had this New York Times article about this mother who was on a Zoom call in a closet with, hot, with her two kids banging at the door with her partner, her husband, who also is a parent, who also was at work, um, who, wasn't doing, who wasn't doing anything. So I, I think in this moment, we recognize that a key for economic mobility and opportunity is unlocking the economic mobility and opportunity of all people, and that there are structural factors, particularly around child rearing, child care system, child care, that have locked women out of taking advantage of opportunity and mobility if, if, if that's what they choose to do so for themselves and, 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 and their families. And I think that there was just a study done by McKinsey that I was on the call with that talked about how even with optimism about the opportunities in the economy, there's a huge discrepancy between sort of men and women um, and further disaggregated by race in terms of men feeling very optimistic about the economy today. Like the stock market is doing great, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Coinbase, every, all my cryptocurrency, like everyone's happy, but all these all women are saying, well, I would be optimistic if there was the infrastructure in place to allow me to work. I, I, I would feel op optimistic if my work was respected with wages. I would feel optimistic if I wasn't just called essential, if I was getting essential wages. And, and that's why I think a part of any conversation around the economy has to be a conversation about childcare. And I say that selfishly because the past 18 months have really shown me how people with parents, parents who work and do jobs, incredible human beings. I don't know how my mom did it by herself, but this is tough work. It's important work. Um, it's necessary work, but it's not easy work. If we want people to take advantage of economic mobility and opportunity, we have to give them the chance to do so. And we know that for far too many women in our country, in our state, that is not the case. And I say that to say, I love the emphasis you guys are putting on childcare and putting on early, early childhood education. So I think that's probably the biggest key and the biggest way to unlock economic mobility and opportunity widely shared by allowing women, particularly women of color, the opportunity to participate in the economy, the opportunity to, to, to afford care for their children. So if they choose to do, so if they choose to go to work, it makes economic sense for, for them to do so. And then we also know just in terms of investment, when we talk about economic opportunity, when we talk about economic mobility, again, we're not talking about the fact that people don't want to climb the stairs. We're talking about how for many people, like Langston Hughes said in, in his poem about his mother, that for many people, life isn't a crystal stairway. That some, some steps are missing for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that some people don't have stairs or in, some people have an elevator and some people don't have stairs. And, and, and any solution has to be one that's not about fixing people's legs. It's not about making people do more um, leg exercises. It's about how do we fix the stairway? How do we make sure everyone has a, has a stairway, which looks like sort of, we know what works. We know that early child care, child education is important. That's an important, the most foundational step in stairway for kids born in poverty, for kids not born in poverty, having a zero to three brain stimulation, four to five brain stimulation makes it so folks enter kindergarten ready and able to engage, and able to participate, able to continue climbing upstairs. We know that um, wages are an important part of economic mobility and opportunity. So we know we have to look at sort of wage discrepancies. And, and it, I, I still don't understand the mechanics, how people can be paid differently for doing the same work, but I'm convinced by the evidence that it does happen. So that's something we, we have to address. 80 cents on the dollar is not enough. 90 cents on the dollar is not enough. $1 to $1 has to be where we go. And that's a foundational step, I would argue, for economic mobility and opportunity. We know that in the state of California, for example, there's particular regions of this state that are even further behind than others. And I am of the opinion, which it may be the most popular mayor, but for folks that have had th things done against them by government, mm -hmm. they have to have things done, especially for them by government. Like that's the only way we get to building a staircase that actually works in equitable. I've been speaking with this administration about in terms of our American Rescue Plan package, if we're talking about economic mobility and opportunity, what do we do specifically for women? 
because we know that all the labor losses in this economy have been from women. So what are we doing, not for everyone, specifically for women, and even further, what are we doing for Black women, Latino women, and Southeast Asian women? Because we know they've been disproportionately impacted. And, and what's the strategy, what's the plan? So I think another kind of key step in building the staircase is being very specific about what folks need. If different folks need different, if there's different barriers to entry in terms of access to opportunity, that necessitates different solutions. That doesn't mean treating people differently. That doesn't mean um, giving people an unfair advantage. It means acknowledging that in the status quo, there are centuries worth of unfair advantages and we have to do what we can in the present to rectify that because we all lose out when everyone's not able to participate fully in our economy. When we talk about economic mobility and opportunity, it also means providing folks access to the future. And make, I, I remember, probably shouldn't say this, it's recorded, but it's the truth. I remember when I was mayor of Stockton, they would always want me to tell my folks to be truck drivers. And, and, and I'm like, I, I, I love, I love truck drivers. I love teams, those are my folks. But we also know in the next 10 years, there won't be as many truck drivers because things are going to be automated. Right. So why not train our kids for the stuff that we know is going to happen? Train our kids in computer literacy and, 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 and coding and being able to drive, be a truck driver, but from behind a computer, um, right? Because and, and, uh, far too often, particularly this co conversation we're having about the importance of, of the trades, which are very important. But we're doing a grave disservice because when we have conversations about the trades, we're not talking about kids at Beverly Hills High. We're not talking about kids at Harvard Westlake. We're not talking about kids at Palo Alto High School. We're talking about kids like the schools I went to, like Franklin High School. And I think it's very dangerous and disingenuous to have a conversation, to set people up, to make it seem like it's an opportunity. We know that's going to rapidly change in the next 10 years. So yes, trades are important, but trades are changing. So let's make sure we're training kids in the trades of the future, right. not in 1930 woodshop. Teach our kids 3D printing, not in like it, it, like we're, we're, we keep reverting. But, but it, it, it was frustrating. It's not, it's not for all kids. Right. Only some kids. We have this conversation about how everyone doesn't want to go to college. Only for some kids do we have this conversation about sort of shop and not, not say those things are bad i'm saying but if it's good if they're not bad they should be good for everyone there shouldn't be a, a conversation about some opportunity for some folks and some opportunity for other folks and the opportunity conversation for some folks is one based off of opportunity in 1940 mm -hmm. an opportunity what built the middle class after world war ii it is 2021 we have to have an honest conversation about what opportunity looks like for our young people and making sure that they're prepared and, and ready for that and taking the same models, the same schemes, the same type of work, but just updating them <laughs> so that they meet the moment that we're in. All this technology and infrastructure around the green economy and sustainability, uh, particularly for folks most impacted by climate change, is, it seems to me low hanging fruit. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about kind of economic mobility and opportunity is that I am maybe the most bullish and optimistic person on people. I truly believe that the vast majority of people spawn, respond positively to positive opportunity. And I say that from experience. In Stockton, we gave those who were the most likely to be shooters or shot opportunity for job training, for tattoo removal, for social services. And homicides went down 40%. We, we created a scholarship right. program to give opportunity to young people um, to, to, to access higher education. Because as a former teacher, I realized that for many of my kids, the issue was that this, they were smart enough to understand that I, no matter how hard I work in high school, if I can't afford college, I'm not going to go. <laughs> you could tell me to work hard. You could tell me to do my homework. But if I got to convince my parents to take out all these loans, I'm not going to get to go. Right. So I said, okay, let's remove all excuses. What if I said, I guarantee you, if you work hard, you'll get a scholarship. Guaranteed. And what we saw in the past three years is FAFSA applications went up 25%. That A through G completion rates have gone up 30%. And 
literally because we said <laughs> we provide a real opportunity. Like, look, if you actually do, you're not going to do these things just because it's the right thing to do. But if you do these things, this is a guarantee for you. And, and we saw it again with the guaranteed income where folks were given the opportunity for 24 months to have something as small as $500 as a floor. Understanding that it wasn't permanent. Understanding that it wouldn't last forever. And understanding it wouldn't solve all the issues. But they were able to use that opportunity and do things like pay off debt, like buy dentures, like fix cars, like save up for a rainy day, like, like travel to see family. And this is before COVID-19. And then when COVID-19 happened, they were able to actually shelter in place and not go to work when they had symptoms. And they only were able to do that, they said, because they knew they had $500 coming. Because if not, 1%, literally, I would have went to work with COVID. I had COVID. And I also have bills. And I didn't feel sick. <laughs> I didn't. That's, and, but the $500 made so I could stay home. And that's, sidebar, that's when I became a really evangelist for guaranteed income. Because I realized it's also a public health discussion. So, so in conclusion, um, before I take any questions, I, I just want to say I'm incredibly excited just about the conversations we're having, not just in Contra Costa, but about the state, about how do we do something better. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the conversations we're having. That again, the issue isn't in the people. Right. The issue isn't with folks who are struggling. The issue is structural. The issue is an ecosystem issue. The issue is a policy issue. And I guarantee you, if we concentrate our efforts on the things we can control, because we actually can't control individual behavior. We actually can't control the individual decisions people make. We actually can't control that, yes, of 100 people, you may encounter the one person who doesn't want to do anything. Of all the people in the world, you may have had personal experience with a person who fits all the tropes and all the stereotypes. But we can control policy. <laughs> we we right. can't control the rules, the regulations, the things on the book. We can control what this entity we call government does. And I guarantee if we do that, we'll see a lot more people behave in ways or a lot more outcomes align in ways where um, it's been where it's beneficial. And then and then the Second to last thing I'll say is courage begets courage. And, and I share that because when we started the Guaranteed Income Pilot in Stockton with all philanthropic dollars four years ago, you would have thought I had declared war on America. You would have <laughs> thought I had like planted insurrection on the Capitol. Like just the way the vitriol I received from people from just daring to question and try and, 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 and to trust people. But just Four years later, we now have 50 mayors who have signed up to be part of Mayors for Guaranteed Income. We have the mayor of the second largest city in this country using, proposing using $24 million, not of philanthropic dollars, but in public dollars to do a guaranteed income pilot in LA as a centerpiece of his state of the city address, taking some of that money from the policing budget, right? Like, 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 and that only happened because we did 125 people in Stockton with philanthropic money. And I say that because I think particularly in this work, it could be, it could feel very uncomfortable to take risks. It could be very uncomfortable to deviate. It could be very uncomfortable to push. But I, I think you all agree, like I agree that the greatest risk at this point is to do nothing. The greatest risk is, is to allow, to have titles, to have positions, to have the authority and for nothing to change. For, that just means that it's inevitable. That just means that our effort doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we do or don't do. If nothing changes, it doesn't matter who's in the seat and, and who has a position. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude with 10 years ago, I was on a freedom ride with some of the original freedom runners. And we went through like the South and one guy, his name was Bob Singleton. He looked at me and he said, Michael, I was arrested on August 4th, 1961. Why is that day important? And I said, uh, you were arrested. If you weren't arrested, I wouldn't be here. And then he looked at me and he said, on that day, Barack Obama was born. And then he said he had no idea that the choice he made as a person 
with no title really to get on the bus and to actually do something to change what he felt was unconscionable would pave the way so a child not a child born with no opportunity with the chance to be president. And then he looked at me and he said, what are you prepared to do today so a child 50 years from now has more opportunity? And I think that's the question that motivates me every day. And I think that's really the question that motivates this group. And, and it's not about seeing and, and just talking about all the ways things are broken and wrong, although those can be therapeutic and that, that's a good first step. It's not about sort of wishing things would get better, um, disattached from like our actual agency and ability to do something. It's really about what are we committed to do individually, each and every day and collectively without a guarantee that what we're doing will work, right? Without the benefit of a crystal ball that says this is gonna be perfect, but with the realization that the status quo doesn't work, that the status quo is actually untenable and that we have a, I would argue, moral responsibility to do something to improve it. Even if it's not a perfect improvement, even if it doesn't get us to 100% of where we need to be, but it's something that's really better. And, and, I, and I, that's the question I'll, I'll leave with you all, just what are we prepared to do? What are you prepared to do? So that 50 years later, the conversation in Contra Costa County is different. Right. And it's not about sort of disparity. It's not about inequity. It's about shared prosperity. It's about, wow, look at what these folks did 50 years ago. We're so thankful for them and their work because the world we live in is so better than what seems like a dystopia. Um, that they that they lived in, persisted through, um, and helped create the, the the world we now get to live in. So again, thank you, Kristen. Yeah, Happy no. for those questions. Well, thank you, and I um, there's lots of appreciation for you in the chat from different folks. Um, and I at the at the risk of dating myself about how old I am because I am older than you. Um, you know, uh, closer to your mom's age. Um, I will say that. Um, I was in policy school at Georgetown. We like to think of it as the Harvard on the Potomac. Um, right, shortly after President Clinton signed um, welfare reform into law, right? And I had professors that were just really plain that said, look, we chose independence as the core value rather than ending poverty. And that is going to be like that, you know, this sort of, and, and the professors at Georgetown were a little upset and frustrated about that choice. I'm worried about it. And so I am so excited about the paradigm shift that you have helped to usher in because I believe, you know, courage begets courage and I believe courage is rewarded. And I think that you're doing some really exciting things. So um, let me just start. There are a couple questions about this. There's a question regarding universal income or targeted income. And if you could speak to that and what you, in terms of what you recommend or what you, you know, at this juncture, I mean, I also realize that we're, we're learning. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, speak to that. Yeah, I am in favor of targeted universalism, um, <laughs> which is a fancy way of saying I am, like, I'll be, I would be happy to get $1,000 a month, and, but I don't need it. Mm -hmm. And if it's a political question, and if the cost is an issue, I would rather we get the money to folks who we know absolutely need it and build from there. And I, and I think I just come at it from a different, like well, my- the follow up, like, so talk, let's talk about the criteria for how you define yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, but la lastly, I would say my, my interest in guaranteed income comes not from an interest in automation and not in the interest of like artists, which I love. Like I have a preferential op option for poor people. Like my interest in guaranteed income comes from like, I don't want anyone to be poor, right? right. So because of that, I, I kind of get an argument with universal basic income folks all the time. I'm not against universal basic income. I just think given the political culture we live in, it'll be, it'd be a harder case to do something universal versus what we've seen with the stimulus package, which are things that are targeted, but targeted in a very broad way for folks making 75K and below or 150K and below, which is like 90% of this country. And in Stockton, we did something very similar. We look, and, But we did this from listening to our constituents. Our constituents said, that they knew we could only get to 125 people, but they want the process to be one that was fair so that as many people as possible at least qualified, even though all the people wouldn't get it. And that's why our criterion was you had to live in a census tract at or below the city's median income, okay. uh, which means that that's the census tract, not the individual. So there were some people in the program who actually made more than the city's median. And there are some people, people that, that made less than the city's median. 
Um, and, and that was also, I think, important politically because it showed people who are making 60K or 70K who on paper look like they're doing good, but actually had a lot of debt, actually had like four kids with their 70K. So, they, right. so that little bit of money um, re really helped. So no, I think so. I think universal basic income is a great goal. I think politically, we'll probably get a guaranteed income before we get a universal basic income. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. I mean, and, and these pilots are um, sprouting up differently. I mean, Oakland pilot, uh, as I understand it, actually is targeted specifically at low income people of color. I mean, this is a it's there's a race criteria that's in, you know included in that, um, and I think it's important to. To talk about that and be intentional about it and I, you know i like what you said about like when government has done bad things to people government should do good things for those people and i think that's you know in line with what what mayor schaff is doing there i don't know if you want to comment on that yeah and i appreciate what mayor schaff is doing because she's saying i'm interested in using guaranteed income to tackle not just poverty but also tackle kind of racial wealth gaps right and that's why she says so because of because my my mission is twofold I'm going to target it in some way. And I, yeah. Yeah, well, because uh, black home ownership is at a rate not seen since it was legal to discriminate by race in California with policies and practices. And so, you know, it's just, there's an extraordinary amount of work we need to do, which is, you know, why everyone here is in this room. Um, now, in terms of following up on, um, there's so many things that you touched. In your new role, um, if you are wildly successful, um, whether that's uh, through this first term, you know, you talked about how you're glad you didn't wait to your second term. Um, we could have a whole separate um, dialogue about misinformation <laughs> on the internet, and um, you know, don't get me started. I'll have you I know, here. I know, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, don't want to, don't want to trigger you on that. But, um, but if you're wildly successful, what will you have accomplished in this role with Governor Newsom? If I am wildly successful. Um... Hmm. I, I don't want to speak for the governor or his team, but if Michael Tubbs is wildly successful, California won't have poverty. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, it's weird because when I say that, people look at me like I'm crazy. No. It's like literally my goal. I'm like, like I don't, like, like, we might like get there, but there's already energy around ending child poverty. We've already saw how we can do that by half. Um, at, at, at the federal level, right. and, and I mean, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. There's so much kind of wealth that's created. Um, there's so much wealth that's created that doesn't go back into the public coffers, particularly the wealth we create with the information we give to, to the internet through kind of advertising, except like through the data. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think there should be some sort of data dividend that everyone yeah. gets. No, I, but I'll be wildly successful there. I, I think having a CSU in Stockton um, is also important. It's the largest city in the state and the second largest in the country without one public institution of higher learning, uh, which is actually ridiculous. And I would, and there'll also be kind of regional specific, there'll also be a strategy for kind of inland California. And I say that because like Kern County doesn't have this partnership even though Kern County probably needs it more than Contra Costa. Right. Like San Joaquin County doesn't, right. no, no, but I mean, like there's me yeah. there, but if you look at like San yeah, Joaquin yeah. No, County, no, no. like all the no, counties, no. like all the counties who absolutely dire miners yeah. canary house on fire need this level of planning and forethought. Right. Okay. Besides Fresno just don't have it. So I think yeah. in that way, the state playing a role in learning from you all and convening similar tables. And if there's not local players there, then having the state take it on as like a project, like we're deeply invested in the success of Kern County, mm -hmm. um, will be, we'll be super successful. We'll I, don't look at, I don't look at you funny for wanting to end poverty in California, full stop. I mean, I, I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I like that audaciousness and it's important and it's, it's possible. Um, I remember the first time I met someone in New York City when I was living and working there who absolutely knew that ending homelessness was possible and it was an imperative right and it, it, it you know there are things that are possible one of my personal goals is to that when i talk about our kids that everyone knows that i'm talking about all of our kids not just about my two children who you know who happen to be 15 and 12 and are both you know at school today, <laughs> which is a big deal um 
but um, but anyway, well, I um, I do want to be uh, respectful of time, and you had sort of about forty five minutes, and we are four minutes over that at this point. Um, but I do I do know that there is a lot of interest in regionalism in this administration in working together. You know, we you know our 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 sister organization has endorsed Mr. Salas's Regions Rise Bill, and you know trying to do and trying to learn from you know because so I am deeply invested in, in, in and I, I've seen just the power of cross-sector collaboration of collective impact but also particularly around economic development it being strategic and I love the fact that you guys aren't just talking about buildings and plants and companies but you're talking about people because there's no economy without like humans right. but like I've been in so many conversations where we're talking about like cranes and like land use which is important but it's like okay but what about the no People. Human human capital <laughs> human capital investment matters a lot. Keith Archuleta would be upset with me if I didn't mention that on this call, and he's listening in. So, as a task force that we have talked about, is the need to really be aggressive with all of our jurisdictions about what they're doing with their money, and making sure that it is the highest and best use of this money. Y'all, I'm telling you, yeah. you're, you're, they just I. <laughs> I thought I would end up working in the White House. So we were having conversations earlier this year about what to do with this money. And I said, listen, I was in local government. We're gonna say we need a lot of money. We do need some unrestricted dollars, but we also need like some database tell us what to do dollars <laughs> because you don't give us all this money and no one has time. Everyone's busy. The unions are up for contract. All that money is gonna go to kind of employee costs. And our employees are great, but that's not the best use of that dollar. So I would say, your counties are getting like hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars. Yeah. Um, I like LA as a city is getting a billion dollars, yeah. right? And so the it, it thing is just everyone's so busy, but if someone could carve out some time, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. what are these, what is my county doing? Because I know in Stockton, when I was mayor, I would fight with our county a lot because they just got a lot of money and they weren't doing anything with it. And no one knew, so I wouldn't just raise the issue. And they received like a hundred million dollars in, in COVID dollars, seventy million dollars of it went to the sheriffs, the sheriff department. Which, in my numbers may be a little bit wrong, but a significant amount went to the sheriff's department, a sheriff's department that wasn't even in, in, the, the sheriffs that were not enforcing COVID mandates. So again, that, that but it's but the money could be transformative. And my greatest fear in this moment is that we'll actually spend money, have all this money but there's no plan for the dollar so nothing moves and then we actually just spend money again not just friends on the right but friends in general will be like well look we just spent a bunch of money we spent trillions of dollars like what changed yeah we have to be able to you know we have to be able to point to some outcomes like what changed right like money is important and which is funny come from the guaranteed income guy but like <laughs> money is an important solution but i said that money is is an important solution, but it's not the only solution. Right. And money without a strategy is just waste. And I'm, as a government official, I know, I'm like, okay, how are we spending this money? Like, put some thought behind it. Like, think strategically. How are we going to use these dollars to advance these goals? Right. Well, um, and my Uber is outside, so I have to go. Oh, yes, for you go. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. I'm grateful. We'll be in touch. Call on us if we can be helpful. Really and same here. I really, if there's anything the state can do or the state should know of, um, learn plan when things open up some sort of tour to kind of listen and learn yes. and hear. So I'd love to make sure I, I, I connect Perfect. with you all. We'll send the Uber for you. Yes. Thank you. I'll, thank all you. Right. Take care. All right. Bye -bye. All right. Okay. Well, um, I, I had a gut feeling that that would be um, a, an important person to help inform our work. Um, and I had very high expectations for that conversation with Michael Tubbs and he managed to go ahead and exceed all of them. Um, and so um, I'm a little bit like, I just wanna kind of pause and um, appreciate that, um, that experience. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is um, provide an opportunity in breakout rooms that we want you to stay, we want you to go into these breakout rooms and think about what we just heard and what we've learned, right? And, and what recommendations should our task force, uh, whether you're technically part of the task force or not, but you're here and you listened and you learned, 
what should we recommend in terms of early childhood education in Contra Costa, use of the American Rescue Plan funds? I appreciated Michael Tubbs' candor about all of that. What approaches mentioned today resonated with you and why? Should we recommend to Contra Costa that we implement a, a universal basic income pilot or some sort of um, you know, guaranteed income, income floor, pick how you ever you want to call it, um, and talk about how you think we should structure it. How can we better communicate the role of childcare and early childhood education in reducing child poverty and increasing economic opportunity? So um, just want to go ahead and we'll spend some time um, in breakout rooms talking about that, and then we'll come back together and, and wrap things up. So, um, wow, I'm just a little bit... Uh, a little bit uh, blown away by what we just got to cover and um, really, really enjoyed that time with Michael Tubbs. So go ahead and we're gonna, we're gonna send you to some rooms. Hopefully you'll just accept that. Um, and uh, obviously do understand if you can't stay to stay in for part of this part of conversation, but we just wanna um, uh, uh, try to capture everybody's best thinking. So the, the CCEP staff is gonna be in different breakout rooms and we're gonna be your scribes and um, talk about some of these, uh, these issues. So. Um, look forward to that conversation. Thanks, everybody. Well, uh, welcome back to the main session, folks. For those of you who have stuck with us through the whole time, I just want to um, thank you for um, being with us today. And I think that we, uh, as I said a minute ago, I, we had really high expectations that I think we're, we're really exceeded by everybody, by our panelists who started the day setting the perfect context. And and then to um, to really, I appreciated that Michael Tubbs had, had given some thought to what we were doing and understood what, like really where what we were talking about and where we're headed. So um, I certainly want to take him up on um, his offer to, to do a listening tour and making sure that, that we're part of that. Um, and so um, just want to thank you for your continued, um, continued work here. Just looking ahead, our task force meeting a week from Wednesday um, for April will include um, really kind of talking about, you know, making sure that we're uh, going after the Board of Soups for the, to have money spent in the ways that we do. Certainly want to invite our Coco Kids partners, again, first five. If you have, um, you know, and any, you know, any of our, any of our partners here, Rubicon or others, if you have submitted requests or recommendations around how American Rescue Plan funds should be spent, let us know what those are. I'd love to be able to, how to, how to, um, you know, amplify, put an exclamation point. I love that Devorah used that in, in, in her remarks. Like, how can we support as a task force some of those requests and how can that inform what we are asking for as a whole? So um, we're gonna be also, I'm gonna be participating along with Patients of Fudu um, from the Workforce Development Board in a, in a regional conversation. The San Francisco Foundation is convening with uh, the mayors of San Francisco, San Jose and Oakland, as well as all the partner organizations around the region's eco economic recovery. And so, you know, those three cities did some real folks like kind of crisis focused economic planning last spring. And as you think about, uh, you know, what we've learned and where we're at, it's interesting because our, our perspective gets to be a little bit different because of, of how our work was structured. And so, but patients and I are looking forward to representing Contra Costa in that conversation. So we'll be at that conversation is happening on Thursday. So we'll be able to report back next week about where that, where that went. And um, as we talked about last month, we're really committed to finishing strong. So, um, with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn. And um, thank you so much for all that you contributed today. And we'll see you soon. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.